what am I going to say? <laughs> Holding on to a stuffed animal and your beautiful music. So, um, you okay back there, Damien, without this little guy? Are you feeling? Oh, okay, you got somebody else. Two timer. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Well, I love you, whatever you are. So, um, this has been a real journey myself with these uh, lovely um, gifts to the community at large because our yoga class has sat with these as the uh, population has come forth. And so many of them have a story, have such a sweet story that some of you will never know. I feel like they've all been to counseling with me. <laughs> and I'm gonna miss them, I'm gonna miss them. And I'm trying not to steal any of them. So th this guy has been with me a lot, but I'll make sure he goes, Mary. I try to keep him free, set him free. This little guy, um, the Sizer's brought in, and it's from the um, Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. And Barbie years ago took the uh, uh, took a foundations class, and one of the projects at the end was um, she adopted the ele baby elephant for our, from our church in our name, and we so our church had had uh, saved a little baby elephant. And so she actually got this from the organization and he's particularly cute. He's from Africa, right? So anyway, I thought what a treasure that one is. So he's got his story, but I need to put you down because I'm gonna be distracted. <laughs> yeah, need to be loved. So, uh, uh, this. <laughs> there we go. Here's my notes. So the talk today was discovering greatness. And Damien read some very powerful quotes to lead in to this. It seems so long ago as we listened to that beautiful piano music and were transported somewhere else. But the ideas, this great discovery, this first great discovery that uh, the human made was that we could think. And that first day that we could think, we started to recognize and build upon that recognizing the I am-ness. And as I share this, this talk, focusing on this life is joy from Roger Teal, he shared this passage in there that we are always, always surrounded by angels. And Paul had sent this email out about angels explained by children. I shared some earlier, but I wanted to, to clue you in. It's, it, um, it's not easy to become an angel. First you die, and then you go to heaven, and then there's still the flight training to go through, and then you've got to agree to wear those angel clothes. That was Matthew's wisdom, age nine. Um, angels work for God and watch over kids when God has something else to do. <laughs> My guardian angel helps me with math, but he's not much good at science. <laughs> Henry, age eight. Um, angels, oh wait, I, this one. Uh, when an angel gets mad, he takes a deep breath, counts to 10, and when he lets his breath out again, somewhere there's a tornado. <laughs> That's Reagan, age 10. Um, and this is from Sarah, age six. Angels have a lot to do and they keep very busy. If you lose a tooth, an angel comes in through your window and leaves Monday under your pillow. Then when it gets cold, angels go south for the winter. <laughs> Um, my angel is my grandma who died last year. She got a big head start on helping me when she was still down here on earth. Isn't that precious? That was Ashley, age nine. And some of the angels are in charge of helping sick animals and pets. And if they don't make the animals get better, they help the child get over it. That was Vicki, age eight. 
And that, that that's precious. That precious innocence of trying to describe uh, something that as an adult we just either take for granted or dismiss uh, what, was an, what is an angel. And so the idea, Roger invites us to remember the, the greatest discovery is the power of this mind that we have. And we have a power within our thinking that allows us to, and I want you to think back on, on the science, this, this is religious science, so when you think about a thought and the chemistry that follows that thought, that's an angel. <laughs> the, um, the thoughts that you have release chemistries in your body. And those, those hormones and chemistries that are affecting us all the time, they can be the stress hormones if we're constantly repeating worry thoughts, if we're overthinking something and causing ourselves to stress that agitates the, the medium of the body and we just tend to attract um, illness and disease from that. We can cause our, our bones to ache and uh, our immune system to be affected. And so that's the science behind the thinking and the chemistry in our thoughts. And so we recognize that sometimes after the fact, sometimes after the fact, we're already sick and when people have said to us, what's in your consciousness, we realize uh, that that is a very annoying statement, but at the same time, an invitation to calm down and to listen deeply and to look deeply because there's a still small voice within you longing for you to know yourself, to know thyself. It's in the scriptures, all of the scriptures from all the faith paths to know yourself at this deep level. So this idea of our memory, I spoke a lot about at the nine o'clock service, but just to touch upon our memories are often unfinished business in our lives. They can be wonderful, beautiful, good memories, but they can also be memories that pull us back into feeling less than, not good enough, uh, disempowering ourselves and allowing ourselves to weaken. But every time we have that memory, the memory is a thought. The memory is releasing that chemistry in your body. And we, we sometimes forget that. We think we're just going down memory lane. So you cannot free yourself if you're a prisoner of your thinking and a prisoner of your memories. Your choice is to boldly take on the mission of greatness by looking deeply, looking deeply and honestly into your suffering. Look deeply and honestly and lovingly into your pain and discover an underlying pattern of your years of habitual thinking. Then this isn't something flippant, remember. It's not something to just take a one look at, a glance, and think, okay, I did it. I kind of remember my Aunt Norma did this. No, go deeper. What did it feel like? What did you, what did you take away with that? Because the Aunt Norma was just an instrument she was being used for you in my situation, for myself, to have a greater understanding of my self-worth because she was the one that would whisper to my other sister, you're so much better than Sue. And I would hear those things just being three and four. And I'd think, well, what's wrong with being Sue? And, and I grew up with that. That was always in the background of me. And so oftentimes I'm, I'm criticized by people um, trying to get people to like me or to, all of these different um, things that I hear about who I am. And I look at the truth behind that. And I know a lot of those moments are me trying to undo that Aunt Norma voice. And I think you all have, maybe perhaps, had those kinds of experiences where you heard something, it lodged in you, and you started to build a sense of your unworthiness from that. It became a memory but if, we're, if I'm to honestly look into that, it's really asking me in that deep inquiry to heal that, to witness my wholeness, to remember who I am. There is the idea, the greatest discovery is recognizing that we are thinking and that we begin the process of I am. So what do you follow that I amness with? I am going to feel sorry for myself the rest of my life and beg you to like me or be, be who I am. 
to expose myself in such a way for each one of you the invitation can you expose yourself in such a way that the true self is revealed and that you walk in a greater truth and a greater power because you're choosing now to align yourself with that beautiful witness that beautiful state of your soul that is aligned with the divine and the one mind that is always feeding us a greater truth and leading us back into our wholeness so we are witnessing always the opportunity no matter what we face where's my wholeness here ernest hemingway was quoted as saying the world breaks everyone and afterwards many are strong at the broken places but maybe not in the way that we think but in a softer way we become more beautiful than before as we become more gentle with ourselves and discover that there is for us a second chance to love there's always that second chance to love. We are not prisoners of our memory. So we're here, each of us, to decide to trust again when we were taken down. We have to recognize our deep worthiness, the real us, the deep self. The deep self that went through whatever it was, the deep self, the true self, was always with you, always holding you always loving you, always. And when we can sit in the holiness of that, knowing, know thyself, every scripture becomes a healing anointment upon your heart. You can feel it. Just allowing yourself, what did I need to hear? What did I need to learn from this moment? We start to trust in goodness again. We start to feel, feel inside of ourselves again. We begin to trust again. We begin to trust and recognize this deep self went through ever, whatever it was. The deep self, the true self, the divine self was always with you. You were never abandoned. So pain, and we look at pain, becomes our greatest teacher. His chapter on, in this book, in this life, is joy. If you're reading it, it is that disease is the greatest discovery. And flipping that around, we're just looking at it from a, from a slightly different angle. But his words, he says, people, people we love are in pain. We're in pain. To be human and to live is to eventually know pain. I remember the stories of Siddhartha, the Buddha, going out to, he was so uh, protected. We try to protect our children from not having to suffer or have pain. But the story, the true story is they all must go out and discover what pain is. And as they do that walk, they return again, enlightened in knowing what is greater than pain is this love and this community of sense of being in service then to humanity to touch everyone's pain, so pain becomes a great teacher. To, to be human and to live is to eventually know pain. It can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be in forms of relationship, it can be in a form of abuse, and then we learn how to blunt it instead of face it or hold it or allow it to be our teacher. We blunt it, we booze it up, we take pills, we find a better way through another medium just to stuff it and to ignore it, but the, the call is always there. There's a voice inside of you. There is the body asking you, pay attention to your sore feet. Pay attention. I am calling you. I am calling you. Pay attention. You have this one precious life. Pay attention and let us heal whatever has been held and trapped in a memory somewhere inside of you that longs to be released. And you release that into a healing and the other person is healed as well. And so we begin to create a greater humanity. We begin to create a shift for all beings. So think about that as, as you listen to your pain. Can you find someone that you can that will reverently listen to you as you share your pain without trying to fix you. Can, this is an invitation, if you look at it and hold it with sacredness, to change the depth of conversation 
as you face your pain's truths, as you pour it out to God or to the people that you love that will listen and ask someone to hold your hand, ask for help through your pain, ask for help and raise yourself from the suffering. Sometimes that's where we block ourselves. We're afraid to do that. We're, we're afraid to move to that discovery. But Ernest Holmes is reminding us that everything has a significance. We can't overlook anything that has ever happened to us. Whatever is there has meaning. It has an emotional charge. Remember, as I spoke of the memory, it's a thought. It has an emotion. It triggers the chemistry in the body. It triggers the proteins that are then created in that medium. There is a genetic factor to every body, to every human, and human body. There's this genetic influence. But what's greater than that genetic influence? the divine influence. And when we can truly anchor in that, there's a surge of power and a sense of glory that moves through you and you recognize, I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck here. I can co-create with that divine medium that is of perfection in me and override that genetic factor. As I quit focusing so much on that, and turn my attention to that which is greater. It's a big invitation. It's an invitation that has deep meaning because it's an invitation that is emotionally charged. Because this invitation is asking you to go back into yourself where you have created those belief patterns. In those belief patterns, you have trapped your fears and your regrets. So. These, these memories that you're revealing are asking for yourself to know yourself and to call for this deeper healing. So what happens when you're suffering? Watch for this. It is so beautiful because you will find it in the most innocent ways. You will turn and someone will say to you from the depth of their heart, here I am. Here I am. I'm so sorry that you're feeling that. Let me, let me take that suffering. Let me take that pain. Let me use the alchemy of my knowing to transform that. And as you receive this gift of knowing that I am here, I am here for you and I am listening. And now another day passes and you find yourself in pain and you find you seek that one Will you listen to me? And they turn to you and they say, here I am. That's what humanity is. Here I am. Here I am. I never went very far. Let me listen to you. Let me, let me allow you to hear what is buried inside of you so that you can transform that thought. You can use the imaginal mind that you are gifted with by the divine influence to transform that and to co-create now how you choose it to be. Will it cure everything? Maybe not. Maybe it is your destiny to have that be your ultimate outcome. But it will heal everything, which is the magic of the mystery. Because when you know you are healed, you are set free, and nothing can frighten you again. It's the most glorious moment. The greatest discovery is to realize that I have now taken this disease, this, this issue that I have been so troubled and burdened with, I have lifted it from my consciousness and I have allowed myself to be set free. When someone we love is in a vulnerable place and in pain, remember it's an invitation to love them even more. And knowing that our prayers, again, won't necessarily be the cure, but we're outlining in our words a healing as we speak words that come from the heart space, from the altar of our heart, from that Christ conscious knowing that there is a depth and a truth that's within you. And when we bring this idea of healing, this truth, we make room for this peace to carry us through. And we change all things. Our prayers our conversation with the divine, our conversation with that still small voice who has habituated, who has allowed itself to, to take up residence in your being. 
It was born in you and it never leaves you. It is the witness, the friend, the truth, the love. It is your nature. It is the divine. It is what you name that, that allows you to connect with that which is greater that we live, move, and have our being in. It is the prana, the life force, the chi. It is that which we breathe. And so we align with that and we're getting rid as we align with that. We shed the anger, the fear, the resentment, the arrogance, the pettiness. As Rabbi Leader spoke in his beautiful book, more beautiful than before, it's how tr suffering transforms us. This is the most powerful great read. It is filled with genuine stories of this rabbi who found himself in tremendous pain from an injury and he got addicted to Oxycontin and he hid that from his humongous congregation. He's got one of the largest Jewish congregations down in the Southern California area. But he walked that walk to get out of that addictive way. He had to face his pain and hold his pain in a whole different way. Did his pain completely disappear? No, but his pain cracked him wide open. As uh, Leonard Cohen sings so beautifully in that song about the light, let the light, crack, let the light in. As we crack ourselves wide open, the light of the divine bursts forth in greater glory and greater understanding. And so he is, he is reminding us in this beautiful book that um, we're, in, we're thinking and we're allowing ourselves to use our thoughts to transform and use our, our energy in that way to be of benefit to the other who is suffering and never making the suffering any small event at all. He said, shall the Messiah come to us in the clouds of glory robed in majesty and crowned with light? One sage imagines this question posed to us to no less an authority than the prophet Elijah himself. Where, the sage says, Elijah, ask Elijah, shall I find the Messiah? At the gate of the city, Elijah replies, how shall I recognize him? He sits among the lepers. Among the lepers, cries the sage, what is, do, what is he doing there? He changes their bandages, Elijah answers. He changes them one by one, reaching out to those who suffer, one by one is a holy act. Reaching out to yourself in suffering is a holy act, and you are each most worthy of that. As we are at the edge of a, of a whole new decade, 2020, may we begin that with, with sincere prayers of heart that allow ourselves to, to truly be invested in this absolute knowing he goes on to say, I have understood how people can pray for mercy and compassion from God, but not be merciful and compassionate with themselves. Compassion is central to every major religion in the world. In the most famous Jewish example, a pagan asked the great rabbi to explain all of Judaism to him while standing on one foot. Not much time to explain an entire religious tradition. The rabbi summarized an entire worldview by saying, do not do unto others what is hurtful to you. The rest is commentary. Now go and study. Succinct, right? Uh, we could spend week after week sharing this, this wisdom, these, these blessings. But it's up to you to be patient, to, to see your answer, to see your way. And there was a, a funny little story that Roger Teal shared that I kind of got, um, I've heard this before, but I hear it in a different way. He speaks of, of the two ladies, two elderly ladies uh, driving down the road and, and the, she passes, a, runs through a red light and her friend goes, oh, 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 oh. And she does it again, oh, 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 oh. And she goes, Gladys, do you know you're running through red lights? Gladys says, oh, I'm driving. <laughs> and, it, and I laughed at that, and I've heard that before. But I thought, you know, that's what we do. Oh, I'm driving my consciousness. I'm running red light after red light after red light as my body, as, as the world is calling out to us, longing for our attention, calling to us, calling. 
Are we listening? I am here for you. Oh, am I driving? Yeah. Yeah, you are. And you're, you're, you're missing a lot of information here. Ernest Holmes, there is a quote from him. Healing is revealing. It is not dissolving disease or creating a superior state in the body. Healing is revealing the inherent wisdom, the inherent perfection, and the power throughout the body that is fully capable of dissolving illness and producing a superior state. Now those, that statement can humble you to your knees. And it is important to, to allow ourselves to be humble because there's a soul message here. There's a soul message. There's, he goes to say these soul messages ultimately are bearing good news. There's always messages of spiritual empowerment and unfoldment. When we can turn to that and recognize, we can smile and not feel arrogant with the truth that we receive. But really, sometimes looking at it all and saying, this is a message for me. This is a message that allows myself not to be preoccupied by what did I do wrong? No, no, no. No, no, no. Not about what we did wrong. It's about what can we do right now? How can we co-create what's right now? There's a better approach. So the questions for you to ponder, these are from Roger Teal. What are the messages and opportunities in the situation for you? Whatever I speak of that has popped into your mind or heart, that is yours. That is yours. Find someone to listen to you or listen to yourself. But what is the message and the opportunity there? What is it time to release? What is the time now to embrace? How can I express more love, peace, joy throughout my life? The nations of this world are calling for this one. How can I express more love, more peace, more joy? Instead of complaining and aligning with the frustration. Can I lift myself up and find that greater truth? What is the highest and best for me, for all involved, for this situation? And finally, how could this situation become a transformational launch pad for me, for others, for truth itself? So we look for the good news, and there's always a good news. The key is to allow a sense of that light to touch you, to awaken to you. Ask, believe, and receive. Ask, believe, and receive. There's so much to share in this because we're not just tugging at a weed of consciousness. We're looking at the taproot of deep suffering, of deep universal suffering. Our journey is no different than Siddhartha's when he left the, the comfort of the palace. We've all, we're all walking on that journey. And what is striving to get your attention? What is pulling on your heartstrings? What insights have you already recognized but not really put into your action? So disease can be your greatest discovery. The divine intelligence within you is at the center of all that is. It is the energy with which you're invited to participate in to reveal what is the higher and greater knowing for you. The pain, the difficulty, the disorder, whatever it is, is not the ultimate reality. There's comfort just in knowing that. The bus doesn't stop here. The bus is taking you home to your true self. So look for the awareness messages. Look for ideas, your judgment, your conclusions, your way of being. What's interfering or obstructing you? You have a natural wholeness. We are light, we are energy, we are truth, we are this intelligence. The body itself is just a byproduct of this spiritual essence. So let us look deeply at the body messages, at the soul messages, and how we're jamming that frequency. Ours is to know this truth. And as Judy
plays the, her beautiful music. We go into a prayer of Ernest Holmes as we recognize our divinity. Close your eyes and soften the burdens. Soften the burden and the heaviness of a memory that has continually called for you to listen. It could be a joyful one. It could be one that has strings of tenderness attached to it. But see it now with love so that the chemistries in the body pour love and higher knowing as you reveal and heal thyself. This is a journey, this is a prayer. Heal thyself. Know thyself. You are one with the divine energy, with nature, with that mystery of all that is. And in this short period of time, we recognize the spirit of God made me. And we're each in that spirit recognizing the greatest truth about ourselves. Ernest Holmes, we consciously invite communion with the spirit. We are consciously opening the doorways of our hearts, of our thoughts, to complete and absolute awareness of truth. Let our mind be the mind that was in Jesus. Let our mind be the mind that was in the Buddha. Let our mind be the mind that was in all the great mystics. Let our mind be the mind of the one. I know that there is a presence that came with me when I entered this life and I know that this same presence will go with me when I leave this physical form, for it is the presence of an eternal life, the life that cannot die. And because God cannot fail and because the divine presence within me is God, is my real self, I know that there is a power flowing through my word of faith, which makes straight the way before me. I now have no fear of the past, the present, or the future. And today I am living in the knowledge that God is over all and through all. I feel this presence as perfection. I feel this presence as love. I know this presence as goodness, making my life whole and complete. I know that prayer of Ernest Holmes infuses each heart in this room. It infuses each little stuffed toy in this room. And each one that receives this gift and honors this truth and walks this path becomes enlightened into a greater understanding of their wholeness and their connection and their service to humanity, to nature, to all beings, to all of life. For this I give thanks, for we have risen above the mundane. We have risen above the suffering. We have chosen to take pain and look at it squarely and transform it into love. So I release this word, knowing that the word touches us in a way that allows us each to walk our truth and to transform this world. We are the ones the world has been waiting for. And I give thanks for the courage for the truth of this teaching, for the power of each one of your hearts as we move forward and save the elephants and offer comfort to every child. It's all good, and we are co-creating it all. Thank you, God. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you for listening. I... Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And I wanted to...